Okay, in this section we're going to look at uh, separable differential equations. Sometimes we're given a calculus problem where we just have x's and y's all running around in there. And um, when, when we're doing this, we have to separate things out. And I've got a typo on your notes. So notice that right here it says f of x times g y. Uh, this needs to be f of y, f of y times g of x. So, um, but it's called separable because what we're going to do is we're going to take x and y and get them separated onto both sides of the equation so that just y's are on one side and just x's are on the other. And then we're going to find a solution by um, anti-differentiating uh, or looking at an integral uh, of each side. And, and then it'll be like all the dy's will be together with y's and all the dx's will be together with x's. So uh, let's just dive into this and see how it works in real life. We want to solve for uh, y if dy dx is equal to x y quantity squared and y equals 1 when x equals 1. So this is an initial value problem. Uh, we're given a value for x and a value for y to start with. And so basically what we want to do is we just want to solve this guy out. So um, the first step is to go ahead and distribute that uh, exponent. So I'm going to have dy dx is equal to x squared y squared. And then what we want to do is get the dx out of the denominator. So multiply both sides by dx. And we've done this before previously. And we're going to have uh, dy equals x squared y squared dx. And now what we want to do is get the y's all together and the x's all together. So just simply divide both sides by y squared. And so the problem that we're actually going to be working is the problem uh, 1 over y squared times dy equals x squared dx. This is the actual problem that we're going to work out. And if you want to think of this as y to the negative 2 dy, that might be even better for integration purposes. And then just take the integral of both sides. So we're just going to take the integral of both sides and we integrate both variables. Okay, And, and so when we do that, what we're going to end up with then is y to the negative 1 over negative 1 is equal to x cubed over 3 plus c. Okay? And uh, that's, that's uh, not a big deal at all. This is what our integral looks like. And then they tell us, hey, we've got x and we've got y. Each one of those guys... Um, is a 1. So uh, what we would do is we would just try and make this statement say y equals and then we're going to substitute these two guys in. So in order to get this to say y equals then what we're going to do is go ahead and look at this as 1 over y negative 1 over y equals x cubed over 3 plus c and then we're going to substitute in our values for uh, x and y, which is going to be 1. So now what we're going to end up with is negative 1 is equal to 1 cubed over 3 plus c. And when you subtract the 1 third from both sides, you're going to end up with 4 thirds. So c equals negative 4 thirds. And our end result then, when we substitute that back in for C, it's just going to go right back in here for this guy, right here. And um, what we're going to end up with is, let's, let's make this a little smaller. We're going to end up with y to the negative y to the negative 1 equals x cubed over 3 minus 4 thirds. Okay, but we don't want to leave it as um, y to the negative one. What we want is um, we we want the reciprocal of all of this because we want y to be in the numerator and positive. Okay, and so what happens is you end up with uh, if I look at the reciprocal of the left, I can look at the reciprocal on the right, 
So I need to clear off that negative sign. So I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1. And, and when I do that, my final answer then is going to be y equals um, three, four, 3 over 4 minus 3 over x cubed. 3 over 4 minus 3 over x cubed. Another way that you could say this if you wanted to, to, to be like really cool, you know, you could just put it all together. So you could have 3 over 4 minus x cubed. That would be another way that you could say that one as well. So separating out the variables can come in very handy when you're looking at uh, exponential uh, rates of change. Uh, like populations or money um, or you know whatever that we're interested in and so the law of exponential change um, is in this box right here so if y changes at a rate proportional to the amount present remember rate of change is dy dx okay so we're gonna say that dy dx is equal to some constant times y and then we're gonna let y equal y zero when t is equal to zero then you have this equation right here um, and this is for continuously changing things, okay? Uh, and that's where the E comes from. And you might remember this from pre-calc when you looked at uh, the equation Y equals P times E to the RT when we talked about money that was continuously compounded. So, you know, rates that continuously change. And look, it has the exact same shape, uh, an initial amount, Y0, that was your principal, and then the K and the T, the R represents your K, which is your rate, and then your T is your time. So these equations are identical. You've used them before several times, and in fact, here it is again for continuously compounded interest. So um, they're really handy uh, formulas to use, and it allows us to go in and look at the rates of change of both the Y variable and the T variable because we can separate those variables apart. Uh, and so we're going to look at that, uh, an example of that, on the next slide. All right, so suppose that you have $800 that you deposit into an account that pays 6.3% annual interest. How much will you have eight years later if uh, the interest um, is compounded continuously and then compounded quarterly? Well, our A0 amount is eight hundred dollars and the interest rate that we're interested in as a decimal is point zero six three okay so when we when we plug these into our calculator uh, we're going to use that PERT formula at the bottom equation off the previous page um, but it doesn't look like PERT but that's what you've seen it as and basically it's just going to be that initial amount eight hundred so we would have eight years later. So when we look at it as a function, uh, the amount that we have eight years later, eight is T, uh, and it would be 800 times E. And then as the exponent, it would be eight times 0 0.063. And so when I punch that into my calculator and multiply it out, Eight years later, continuously compounded interest at 6.3%, I'm going to end up with $1,324.26. Okay, so that's compounded continuously. Well, what if it's compounded quarterly? Well, not the bottom equation from the previous slide, but that middle equation. And it's again, it's very similar. So I'm looking at eight years later of that initial amount, 800 times 1 plus, and then now I've got my interest rate, 0 0.063, divided by the number of times I compound the interest, which is quarterly, so that's 4. And, and now I'm looking at, again, uh, how many times I compound it total. So I'm compounding it 4 times a year for 8 years, which is going to be 4 times 8. And when you punch that guy into your calculator, you can see that after eight years at this interest rate, we would have $1,319.07.
So a lot of this right now uh, is pre-calculus, um, but we're, we're changing the way the formula looks just a little bit from what you're comfortable with. Okay, so here's uh, some a little bit more deeper thinking. Find the half-life of a radioactive substance with decay equation y equals the initial value y0 times e to the negative kt. Show that the half-life depends only on uh, k. So the basically what we're wanting to do is look at the half-life equation. So y0 times e to the negative kt. Okay, uh, is equal to the half-life equation, which is a half times y zero. Okay, that's going to—that's what your half-life is, half of your original uh, amount. And so, um, to solve this out, divide both sides by y zero, and it doesn't matter what that initial amount is. The y zeros cancel out, so I've got e to the negative kt is equal to one half and if we can rewrite this as a logarithm and a logarithm is always equal to its exponent and a log base e a log base e don't forget is equal to a natural log so if a logarithm is equal to the exponent my exponent is negative kt and so I would have the natural log of one half And then to get the t all by itself, I would divide both sides by negative k. So just some simple algebra here, nothing too fancy. And I end up with um, negative 1 over k times the natural log of 1 half equals the time. And one of the cool things that you can do uh, with, with logarithms is you can uh, put the number in front as a, as a exponent on the inside. Um, and so when we do that, um, we could, an, an alternative form of this, well, there's a couple forms. One would be the natural log of, um, let's do this. Let's look at just this negative sign right here. And let's put that negative sign in here. So what we've got is 1 over k times the natural log. Now, the hand is quicker than the eye. Remember, this is 2 to the negative 1 to the negative 1. And the reason I can say that is because if I've got this 2 right here and he's in the denominator, then if I move him to the numerator, I give him a negative exponent. And this is actually the easiest way to look at this guy is right here. And so what this is going to give me is the natural log of 2 over k. That's the easiest way to deal with that. So um, in, in this case then, the natural log of 2 is a constant. The natural log of 2 is a constant. And the k value is uh, going to be whatever my, my um, constant of variation would be. So it would be my half-life rule. And notice that answers the question. The half-life depends only on k. Well, look, we did the math. My half-life is going to be log 2 divided by whatever that constant is. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do here is tie this exponential growth into a word problem. So at the beginning of the summer, the population of a hive of bald-faced hornets is growing at a rate proportional to the population. Uh, and, and what this means right here, a rate proportional to the population right there, that's going to be direct variation. Uh, from a population of 10 on May 1st, the number of hornets grows to 50 in 30 days. If the growth continues to follow the same model, how many days after May 1st will the population reach 100? So uh, what, what we need to do is um, recognize that we've got exponential growth uh, going on here. And so what we need, we need a few things. We need like our initial amount, and, and that's that A0 part, and that's going to be 10. And what's happening to our problem? Uh, you know, what's happening to the number of hornets? Well, we went from 10 hornets in our initial count to 50 after 30 days. So, so what we're looking at then is a base of 5, and we're looking at a time 
for that five to be doubled or tripled or whatever. We're looking at a time of 30 days. Okay. And so what this means is for our model uh, on this guy, we're looking at something that would, would resemble this. Y equals the initial amount 10 times the base, which is 5, uh, to the t over 30th power. And this comes from one of your earlier, you yucky, this comes from one of the earlier slides uh, where we looked at um, your models of exponential growth. So uh, this is the model that we're going to use for this particular guy. And then the question is, when will our population reach 100? Well, we don't know the time on that, but what we can do is we can set our y value here equal to 100 because that's what we're interested in. So when we go to solve this problem, we would just say that 100 equals 10 times 5 to the t over 30th power. Divide both sides by uh, that 10. Uh, the 5 is tied up with an exponent, so we can't move him at all. And 10 equals 5 to the t over 30. And then rewrite this as a logarithm. And remember, a logarithm uh, uh, is equal to its exponent. So we would have log base 5 of 10 is equal to t over 30. And multiply both sides by the 30. And what you're going to end up with is 30... Oof, 30 log five log base five is equal to t log base five of ten is equal uh, to t and and so punch that into your calculator and when you punch all of that in we want to go three decimal places because logs grow so slowly but when you punch all that in you're going to discover that after 42.920 days we're going to have a hundred hornets. All right, scientists use carbon-14 all the time uh, to date things that are old um, because it's very consistent with its half-life. It's got a great half-life for dating things, and most animals, I believe, if not all animals, have some, uh, some sort of carbon-14 in them. And uh, so the half-life on carbon-14 is 5,700 years, okay? So find the age of a sample in which 10% of the radioactive nuclei originally present have decayed. And, and so this is a really, uh, it's, it's not a horribly complex problem, but uh, trying to figure out uh, how everything sorts out can be a challenge. Now remember, we saw a couple of slides ago our half-life um, problem, which was involved a, a logarithm of a half, okay? And... Uh, just to give you a quick recap, half-life, a half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by k. And in this case, we're told that our half-life is 5,700 uh, years. Okay, so keep this guy in mind. We may or may not need it, but we can at least um, check it out and, and go uh, from there. Um, as far as trying to solve this problem out. So, uh, the original amount um, that we're looking at, well, let's let's just do this. Uh, we're looking at a base of a half because we're talking about a half-life. So let's just note that real quick. Our base is going to be equal to a half. Our k value uh, in, in this case um, is going to be 5,700. Okay, and t of course is going to be in years. Um, in the previous problem, it was in thirty day, uh, thirty day model, but but now we're looking at an actual year model. Um, and so let's just go ahead and set this thing up from here. Remember, keeping in mind that we could get to this, we may not. But this is a half life relationship. Okay, uh, so. Let's go with our final amount that we have left. And again, this, is, this will also resemble some of those earlier problems we looked at. Times our original amount. And then the base in this case is one half. And the uh, time in years is T. And how many times are we going to do that over 5,700 years is what we're interested in. All right. 
we're told that we want to find the age of a sample in which 10% of the radioactive nuclei originally present has decayed. And, and so if we have 10%, then this A value means that 90% of our original amount is still available. Okay, 10% have decayed. So my problem for this guy is going to look like this. I substitute in my 0 0.90 times A sub 0. So my 0.9 A sub 0 is equal to A sub 0 of a half and then raised to the T over 5700th power. Well, the cool thing here is when you divide both sides by a sub zero, it goes away. So it's it's totally gone and I get uh, 0 0.9 let me write that a little better here. I get 0 0.9 is equal to one half T over 5700 and um, I can rewrite that again with a logarithm and my base would be one half uh, in this particular case so uh, log of, of one half base one half of 0.9 is equal to t over 5700 and so in order to get that t all by itself I'm just going to divide my logarithm um, by that. So I'm going to end up with t equaling the log of one half, base one half of 0.9, ooh, I'm running out of room here, times 5700. And you can punch that into your calculator. And, and if your calculator is one that won't uh, where you cannot put in like a log of a base one half, then you can use your change of base formula. And a really common way to do that uh, would be to look at the natural log of 0.9 divided by the natural log of a half or 0.5. And that will get you the same thing. And again, you would multiply this by 5,700. So when you do that, that's going to tell you what T is. And in this particular case, when you punch all that in, either way you do it, T is going to be equal to 866 years. So uh, that's all uh, that that requires. It just looks different because maybe you're not getting as much information as you're used to. But that initial amount, if you set it up correctly, should divide out and then uh, it shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, in this section we're going to look at Newton's Law of Cooling, which is T minus uh, the temperature of the object at time t minus the temperature of the surroundings uh, and that's equal to the initial temperature of the object when t is zero minus the temperature of the surroundings times e to the negative kt where k is your constant uh, of variation t is your time and typically your time is going to be in hours so here's our problem a hard-boiled egg at 98 degrees celsius put into a pan under running water which is 18 degrees celsius after five minutes the egg's temperature is found to be 38 degrees celsius how much longer will the egg take to reach 20. we're going to have to work this equation out twice once to find k and once again to find the time so uh you're gonna have to work it a couple times it's all good hang in there so here we go newton's law of cooling the temperature of the surrounding area uh, is going to be um, equal to 18 degrees Celsius. So Ts is equal to 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, the initial temperature of the object, so To, is 98 degrees Celsius. Um, and then uh, we're just going to plug those two guys in and see what's missing and see if we can't solve for something in there. So T is the temperature of the object at T. So we'll just go ahead and list that guy. T minus 18 degrees is equal to 
the initial temperature, 98, minus the surrounding temperature, 18, times e to the negative kt. All right, so I can simply, I can actually simplify this down. So subtract 98 from 18, uh, and and move the 18 from the left to the right. So I would have t equals um, 80 e to the negative kt plus 18. Okay, so here's here's what I'm looking at, and then and then we're told the other part of this equation is that the t after five minutes the temperature's 38 degrees. So I can fill in two more pieces now. So I've got a temperature of 38 degrees. 80 times e to the negative 5, because 5 minutes is what we know. K we don't, and then plus 18. So now it gets even easier, and I can just um, sort this guy out real quick. So subtract 18 from both sides. 20 equals 80 e to the negative 5k. Divide both sides by 80, which is going to be 1 fourth equals e to the negative 5k. And then rewrite this as a natural logarithm and what you're going to get, end up with is uh, for this particular piece natural log of one-fourth equals negative 5k and so divide both sides by the negative 5 so natural negative natural log of one-fourth divided by 5 equals k this is our first uh, run through the problem um, and you can I, I would recommend that for accuracy you can leave this guy as K for accuracy if you really 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 want a decimal in there um, that's fine that's not a problem you can do that but but for accuracy your calculator will carry through a lot of those decimal places that we wouldn't normally write down and it can have a difference on things but we would say then that the temperature for this guy, temperature is going to be equal to uh, 80 times e to the negative, and, the, and in this case, a negative times a negative um, would be a, uh, let's see, did I get that right? Negative 5. Yeah. So that would be log one fourth divided by five times t and then plus 18 okay so now all we need to know um, is the you know the time it's going to take for that guy uh, to cool and um, if we were, if we're interested in where it's going to be 20 degrees Celsius uh, one of the easiest ways to do that, in fact, the easiest way, is to take this guy right here, take this guy right here and graph him in Y1, and take this guy right here and graph it in Y2, but guess what? Our temperature is going to be 20 degrees Celsius now. Um, and if you wanted to do it longhand, we could do it longhand as well. It wouldn't be a problem. So let me just make this a little smaller to give myself some room to work. Um, what we would do is we would just, uh, we, would, we would, let's see, I'll do it in red even. So we would say that tw uh, 20 degrees is equal to 80 E to the natural log 1 fourth divided by 5 T plus 18. This would be our setup. And by the way, uh, natural log of one fourth is the same thing as negative log of four. So uh, if you wanted to use that instead, um, that's that's not a, a problem either. Okay. Regardless, we would subtract eighteen from both sides. So two is equal to eighty e to the natural log one fourth over five times t. And then divide both sides by 80. And so you're going to get 1 over 40 times e, or equals, e to the natural log 
of 1 fourth divided by 5 times t. And then rewrite this as uh, a natural log. So the natural log of 1 40th is equal to the natural log of 1 fourth over 5 times t. And when you multiply both sides by the reciprocal of natural log of 1 fourth and 5, um, you'll get your answer. And when I punch this in on my calculator, uh, I get the grand answer for t, whether you graph it or don't graph it, I get t is equal to 13.3 um, minutes. So there's Newton's law of cooling. Uh, you got to work that problem out twice. It can be a challenging thing, um, but uh, if you graph, if you graph from here, uh, it gets a little bit easier. Um, but just hang in there and pay attention to some of those smaller details uh, so that you don't get lost along the way. Double check your math. If you get an unreasonable answer like, you know, 87 minutes, maybe you've gone someplace wrong. So double check your stuff.